Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives episode 112. Today we're going to be talking about the danger of Opus Day. Author Gareth Gore, who just wrote an incredible book called Opus, The Cult of Dark Money, Human Trafficking, and Right-Wing Conspiracy Inside the Catholic Church, is here with us today. This is a wake-up call for America. Have a listen. Gareth Gore, we are so honored you took the time to be with us here today, and I know this is going to fly by very quickly, so let us jump in. You're a financial reporter. You landed this giant story, and can you kind of give people an idea of where it started and some of the explosive findings you found early on that made you want to do this project? I mean, I, I came to this completely by accident. I guess many of the best stories are found completely by accident. I mean, I was sent to report on this bank in Spain that had collapsed, and I just was not... Um, <laughs> was not ready for what I was about to find. I mean, over the, it took me kind of two years to, 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 to get into the story properly, but I got this break. Um, someone hinted at the fact that they basically Opus Dei was behind this bank. And so I basically began digging and, um, and the more I dug, the less sense any of this bank collapse seemed to, to, to make. And um, for me, kind of one critical moment came um, a couple of years into the project, in fact, when this story um, appeared on the Associated Press Wire about a group of women in Argentina, these 42 women, who alleged that they'd been um, enslaved by Opus Dei and they were basically calling the organization out. They, they'd filed this complaint at the Vatican and they wanted compensation and they wanted an apology. So I, I, at that point, I already knew that there were links between the bank I was investigating um, and I ident identified all of these kind of money flows between the bank and these Opus Dei projects around the world. But when I saw this story about the women, I kind of thought, well, obviously that's a terrible thing, but there, there seemed to be no obvious links to what I was researching. But then one day in the archives in northern Spain, I came across this document that had been kind of squirreled away in this hidden pile of documents that that archivists weren't meant to really be filing away and had just been kept almost by accident and it basically detailed how money from the bank had been used to finance schools like the one in argentina where these girls had been these girls as young as 12 13 years old had basically been um entrapped and and coerced to, into joining opus day so from there the the story what had seemed like a story about a bank that had collapsed with a few links to opus day just exploded and took me down all kinds of crazy paths that I never had had anticipated at all. Thank you so much for that intro. And can you please tell our viewers your best summary of what Opus Day is so they actually know from the jump what we're going to be discussing? Okay, so Opus Day officially is uh, is a wing of the Catholic Church. They're officially recognized. They're a legitimate part of the church. They they say that all they do is um, all they are is, is an organization that helps ordinary Catholics to live out their faith more seriously. You know, for those Catholics who want to maybe go a bit deeper and 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 to offer up their daily lives to God through their work or through their family lives. It's an organization that helps them do that. But there's there's also a hidden underbelly to the movement that few people, including many of its members, know anything about. Um, it's basically that there's a core membership called these people are called the numeri members who've taken vows of um of obedience to opus day they're also celibate and they've taken also vows of poverty but these people live a highly controlled existence the ranks of numeri members within opus day are riddled with abuse with mental illness with um with prescription drugs um, and also just with kind of control over even even the, the most minor aspects of their lives that many of them are cut off from their friends and families and they basically are forced to um to live their lives at the whim and command of whatever opus day decides for them if tomorrow opus day decides right you need to move city or country and go and set up a new initiative for us here 
they just go and do it. It's what's expected. Um, so yeah, I think I think actually what I hope the book does for a lot of current Opus Day members um, is open their eyes to this hi this hidden underbelly that's been there throughout the organization's almost 100 year history. Thank you so much for that, Jim. You go next. Um, I was uh, curious about the concept of a personal prelature um, because Opus Dei, as far as I know, is the unique um, uh, category of a personal prelature to the Pope. Um, and I believe um, uh, that started in the 1980s under Pope John Paul II. Um, and the current Pope, if, uh, and if I, if I have this wrong, let me know, I believe has banned personal prelatures in the future. Um, I was I was wondering if you if you had any insight into what that means um, in terms of its relationship with the the power structure of the church itself. So okay, so the this concept of a personal prelature was um, invented in the sixties. It was it was a new initiative that was thought up by the Second Vatican Council. This 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 huge council that was. Um, was basically kind of thinking up new ways for the church to modernize. Um, yeah, Vatican II, right? And, and which exactly. a lot of a lot of people are very angry about still. <laughs> exactly. So this was yeah. um, this came out of Vatican II. I mean, ironically, actually, Opus Dei was very um, annoyed. I guess is what you could say. But I mean, I think it was stronger than that about, about Vatican II, about many of the reforms that had happened. But this was actually one of the reforms that that. Um, they were able to use to their favor um, a few years later. So this new um, invention kind of lay dormant for many years. And then when Pope John Paul II took over, um, I'm sorry, and I should say that initially the personal prelature was envisioned as, um, as a way of ordaining priests into the wider church that weren't affiliated to a particular diocese. It was a way for the church to basically um, ordain priests anywhere in the world and then send them to wherever they were needed. So, you know, you didn't have to be ordained in Washington to be posted to Washington or whatever. You know, it was a way of kind of making things a bit, a bit more efficient and ensuring that the church could send priests to where they were needed. But then when John Paul II um, was elected in the late 70s, he basically came into the Vatican and didn't really... He was an outsider. He didn't really know the thing, the way things worked. At that point, when he became Pope, he already had a very strong relationship with Opus Dei. They'd been, I think it's fair to say that they'd been grooming him to a certain extent during the 60s and 70s. They'd been sponsoring him and um, publishing many of his speeches and, you know, basically fostering a close relationship. And when he became Pope, he turned to Opus Dei as an ally. Because at that point um, in the late 70s and especially the early 80s, the church was becoming a, more divided, especially in the US. You know, you had Catholic bishops calling out the policies of Ronald Reagan saying, look, this is extremely unchristian. Um, and the Pope, um, who was in agreement with many of the policies of Reagan, he decided to clamp down. And the way he clamped down was by elevating Opus Dei within the church and giving it all of these new powers. And they took this form of the personal prelature that had been invented in the 60s just for priests. And they basically kind of bastardized it and kind of changed it around the edges to enable Opus Dei to operate as an independent entity within the church, answerable to no one but the Pope. Basically, for John Paul II, it was a way of, one, legitimizing Opus Dei and giving them a kind of papal stamp of approval. But also what he was doing was creating a mechanism for Opus Dei to operate independently anywhere in the world without the local bishop or archbishop being able to say, just a minute, guys, what's going on here? So it was, you know, it was a huge move. Now, I mean, you were saying there about how things have changed more recently. So Pope Francis in the last few years, Pope Francis has been aware of the problems within Opus Dei and the abuse um, that Opus Dei is riddled with. He's been aware of it since his days in Argentina. Um, and um, 
he a few years ago he took the decision to basically start clipping the wings of Opus Dei. Um, at first he did it, he just made a few very small modifications. Um, but more recently he's becoming a bit more aggressive. And I think given the news that's coming at being coming out of Argentina, and we can talk about this in a little bit more shortly. I'd love to hear about it, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the news that federal prosecutors um, have formally accused Opus Dei of engaging in human trafficking, engaging in the trafficking of teenage girls and young women. Um, I think we could very much, we could very well see um, a big move from Francis in the weeks ahead. I think there's a desire to rein in um, the excesses of Opus Dei and to address the abuses. But the Pope is also aware that, um, you know, despite being the head of the Catholic Church and despite being this kind of all-powerful figure <laughs> at the Vatican, he also recognizes that Opus Dei is, is a power in itself and has many powerful and wealthy allies. So he's treading very carefully. He doesn't want to upset the balance too much. Now, this is the Pope. He can't even, <laughs> you know, take the decisions he wants to make. So, I, um, but I think the latest news could well give him the confidence and ability to drive through the reforms that he thinks are necessary. Thank one you follow, for that. Yeah, I go just ahead. Wanted one follow up to that because you mentioned the wealthy allies. Um, uh, somebody that we follow very closely uh, on this show is Peter Thiel, who has a very interesting um, connection to Opus Dei. Um, insofar as that he had a long lifetime relationship with Arne Panula, uh, who um, uh, maybe you can just tell us briefly who Arne Panula was, and 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 um, you know if if you think that that relationship is significant. So Arne Panula was um, a priest from the Midwest, an Opus Dei priest from the Midwest, who. Um, during the first part of his career, he was posted out to Silicon Valley where, you know, basically ever since Opus Dei was set up, what it's done is go after the rich and the powerful. Um, the rich, for obvious reasons, they want their donations <laughs> to help the organization to fund um, its, its expansion. But they also go after the powerful because um, the mission of Opus Dei is basically to re-Christianize the world according to its, you know, dystopian view of what that re-Christianization might mean. I think many Catholics would not recognize the re-Christianization that, that Opus Dei wants to push through. It's always gone after the elite because um, that's how you change society through politicians, through the judiciary, uh, through billionaires such as, as Peter Thiel. So Ani Panula was posted at Silicon Valley and Whilst he was there, yes, he, he formed a, a pretty close relationship with um, Peter Thiel. And in the book, I mean, I, I recount, you know, on the long walks through the Marin headlands around San Francisco, they would talk about, you know, their shared disdain for, for government and how, um, I guess, liberal attempts to codify certain rights or, you know, to try to basically um, to engage with with issues in you know that were affecting American society that they were misplaced and that you know it wasn't the government's role to step in and and sort out these ills. So they they kind of bonded over those things. I mean, there's one story I recount as well about how at one stage Peter Thiel talks about how technological um, advancement seems to have seemed to have like in his mind stalled out in the mid 70s, which I'm not sure many other technologists would agree with. But he anyway, he was he was obsessed with the, this idea that technological advancement had had stalled out in the in the 70s. And Arnie Panula was like, exactly. And you know why that is? It's because of Roe v. Wade. Um, basically, you know, if we're killing all these babies every year, then of course, we're not advancing because, you know, any one of these babies could have been could have invented a cure for cancer or for this or what that's the reason. So, you know, these two guys would bond over this quite extraordinary view of the world and interpretation of why these things had happened. But Arnie Panula later became a critical figure in Washington. So he was posted to DC to head up the Opus Dei um, Center on K Street, which 
over the years has become a real hub for radical conservatives. Um, you know, look at the- Including the, Kevin Roberts, right? Who I- Leonard yes. Leo. Absolutely, yes. I mean, the, the, it, there's quite a long list. I mean, people who either are current or former board members of the CIC or have, are affiliated to the CIC in some way include, yes, Mr. Leonard Leo, Bill Barr, Pat Cipollone, um, and Kevin Roberts, the president of the Heritage Foundation and the architect of Project 2025. He's a regular at the CIC, um, and he gets his spiritual formation from the Opus Dei priests there. Um, we know that because he gave a speech just last year at the CIC, where he was talking about the Opus Dei founder and how he was inspired by his message. And by now, everybody should be terrified because Peter Thiel's boy, J.D. Vance, is, you know, vying for vice presidency. And all of this is um, actually so chilling. I have multiple questions, but High Fidelity, you next. So I, uh, I'm not terribly bright. So let me just get this straight. <laughs> we, we have an organization that crashed a bank by siphoning off billions of dollars to its high-ranking members. We have an organization that engaged in human trafficking of teenage girls. Is that correct? Um, is accused of doing that. I will it's leave it to the courts of... and okay, to, the, yeah, to, to decide whether or not okay. they're actually guilty. And, and it's we important, have... in his book, he explains that they have vocational schools for girls, so continue. All right. So uh, trafficking, uh, embezzlement, and, and then we have targeting of the rich and, and famous. I, I, it doesn't sound like a church organization to me. It sounds like a criminal operation. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Are, are they operating as a church organization? I mean... Opus Dei has been very successful at taking advantage of the legitimacy that the church has given it, certainly since the early 80s, the, this special status that the Pope has given it, to whitewash its, its image, um, its reputation in the kind of public arena. Um, so they talk about how they all they want to do is just help ordinary Catholics to, to live out their faith more deeply. But as I reveal in the book, the founder of Opus Dei, right from the start, envisioned the movement as a political movement. So he set this movement up against the backdrop of huge political change in Spain in the early 1930s. This was a time when, the you know, basically the workers had risen up, they'd thrown out the monarchy, they were tired of the old regime, including the Catholic Church, the way that the Catholic Church had been complicit in um, all kinds of abuses towards um, you know, ordinary people, i.e. not the not the wealthy or the aristocracy. And Escriba, the founder of Opus Dei, saw this and was horrified at what was going on. And so he he basically set up this organization partly to 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 fight back at, at this kind of um progressive revolution that he saw unfolding before his eyes. He talked about how his followers were going to be a hidden militia. Um, who would basically infiltrate every element of society, you know, government, the judiciary, the education system, the media. And they would go there, they would collect information on what he called the enemies of Christ. And they would basically orchestrate this re-Christianization of society. He, he saw his followers as going into battle against the enemies of Christ. And, you know, this is what these people believe today. I mean, this isn't what Opus Dei talks about when it's going out and recruiting and, and the rest of it, but this is what fundamentally drives the organization. Um, I've been very fortunate in getting hold of many of these foundational um, documents written by the Opus Dei founder himself. For years, these have been locked away. Um, the documents specifically say that these documents have to be locked away and people aren't allowed to see them. They've been hidden from the Vatican. The Vatican hasn't had a clue about 
this kind of hidden agenda of Opus Dei. And so I've been very lucky in being able to get my hands on them and and to to tell the world about them for the for the first time. Wow! Thank thank you for that, um, Jim. Did you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm very interested. So so you found some. Uh, you, you've you got es Escriva is the right way to pronounce it, I'm learning now. Um, uh, Jose Maria Escriva, who's the founder of Opus Dei. For and it should be noted, Day. he's canonized. He's been canonized, I believe, right? Uh, well, yes, and, and that partly where I was going is, is Pope John Paul to if I'm if I'm correct sort of pushed him on the on the path to, to sainthood um in in the 80s and and uh ended up canonizing him in the early 2000s um there's a a a fascinating period in the early 2000s when um the worst spy in American history Robert Hansen um, was a member of Opus Dei, um, was found by the FBI, which had a director who was a member of <laughs> Opus Dei um, at the same time and ended up getting fired by, by George Bush. At that moment, if, if I'm right, Pope John Paul II's sort of personal secretary was also a member of Opus Dei. Um, which sounds to me like a a, a circle um, for a lot of very very um, dark intelligence to go to our enemies, specifically to to Russia. Um, I'm I'm wondering if if any of that sort of intersected in your in your research. Oh, G Gareth has a good answer to Robert Hansen because this is fascinating. I know you do. So, I mean, Robert Hansen is a, is a very interesting case. So he was actually, he, he'd been spying since the, the late seventies, I think it was. And yep. he was discovered by his wife, who was also an Opus Dei member and who continued to teach in one of the, the Opus Dei schools in Washington, DC until very recently, actually. She was, I think, a, a theology teacher at the Opus Dei school in, in DC. Um, she discovered the fact that he'd, he'd been spying in the early 80s, um, I think it was 81, if memory serves me correct. And she was like, basically, we need to go see the priest. We need to go see our Opus Dei priest to, to talk about this, because what, what should we do? So initially, the priest told Robert Hansen, look, you need to turn yourself in. Um, you know, you need to do the right thing. So the Hansons go away, and they kind of resolve, right, okay, tomorrow morning, we're going to go, and we're going to hand ourselves in. Anyway, next morning, they get a call from the Opus Dei priest, who presumably, although we don't know, but but I assume had been speaking about this with his superiors or other people in the residence where he, he, he lived. And he calls and he says, you know what? Um, I think it's probably better if you don't say anything. Um, let's just kind of cover. So, so basically, <laughs> Opus Dei prevented, um, or Opus Dei dissuaded, I should say, um, Robert Hansen from turning himself in in the in the early eighties. He went on to spy for another twenty years, and you know he's notorious. He gave away so many state secrets, put so many lives in danger. I mean, we we know, and I write about this in the book, that information he provided was was responsible for the assassination of at least three American. Um, double agents that the that the the Russians found out about, but you know countless other lives were placed in danger because of this advice in the early eighties from the Opus Dei priest. And I think, okay, we can speculate about why the priest suddenly changed his mind, whether he'd spoken to his superiors or not. I, we don't know, but but what I think it confirms for me is, and we've seen this on, in so many instances with Opus Dei over the years, that. The reputation of Opus Dei, the public reputation of Opus Dei, is something that trumps everything. Like so, so you know whether something's right or wrong is is kind of by the by. How that thing affects how the public perceive Opus Dei, and what impact that might have on Opus Dei's ability to continue recruiting the powerful and the wealthy—that's the most important thing here. Not what's 
not what's Catholic, not what's Christian, not what's right and wrong, but Opus Dei's own interests. Thank you for that. Hi, Fi. I want you to ask your conspiracy question, but I just want to make that point. You talk a lot about how this is cloaked with holiness, but what you just described was something that was so incredibly um, damaging to our national security and certainly the lives of people who were lost doing the, you know, spade work that is so necessary uh, when you're trying to protect uh, the sovereignty of your country. So this is really scary, high level stuff. But Haifa, you had a great question about how difficult it is to talk about this stuff because of the conspiracy labels. Can you can you speak on that, please? Yes. Uh, first, I'd like to amend my previous question and say, just from what you've been saying, you've used the word infiltrate, you've used the word target, you've used the word recruiting. It, they sound like a hostile foreign intelligence agency. Anyway, my question is, you talk about Opus Dei, and we talk about all these very obvious things, the bank, the court case in Argentina, the fact that William Barr uh, is a member, and we know William Barr covered up Iran Contra. We know William Barr was involved with the whole Trump thing and the, and the Mueller report. Um, but how do you tell people, oh, this is Opus Day, without sounding like someone who's a little bit out there like this is the stuff of conspiracy theories right and and dan brown kind of made it this you don't talk about opus day they're this weird shadowy organization oh it's all conspiracy but you talk about it with data how are people yeah. reacting and okay I, I think you know what i spoke to the um to the U.S. head of Opus Dei, who, the guy who was head of Opus Dei in the United States um, in the 2000s and the 2010s. He told me, um, I paraphrase him slightly, but these were almost his exact words. He told me that the Da Vinci Code was the best thing that's happened to Opus Dei in, in, almost in its, in its entire history. So Dan Brown almost did them a favor. So, you know, clearly Dan Brown's novel was a work of fiction. And what he did was he took and, and novelists do this the whole time. They take elements of real life and they fictionalize them. And Opus Dei was able to run with that quite successfully. So what it did was it said, look, this guy, you know, this Albino monk that's at the assassinating figures and stuff, you know, this is so like left field and so crazy that, look, if you really want to learn about the real Opus Dei, then come, we'll come and tell you, we'll tell you all about it. So they, they used it very successfully to market themselves to a much bigger audience. Suddenly the book catapulted them into the mainstream and they were able to really ramp up the recruitment efforts. Um, so the Da Vinci Code was, did them a huge favor in fact. Um, although, I, you know, some of the elements that Dan Brown touches on in his book are absolutely true. He talks about, you know, the, the group's um, medieval practices and it's, it's abuse of women. He talks about these things in the book, but because obviously he kind of goes a step too far in fictionalizing things that they ran with that and were able to to not address the real um, issues. But your, your question about the conspiracy theorists, I mean, it's hard. I mean, I, I, I kind of, there's a line in the book where I, I talk about, you know, this is a conspiracy hiding in plain sight. This was just like a, a high street bank um, where everyday Spaniards put their money and put their savings. Who would have thought that this thing was funding these crazy hospitality schools involved in, or allegedly involved in human trafficking in Argentina and other parts of the world, potentially. Um, and I've noticed, I mean, the book came out um, very, just yesterday. Um, um, I know this podcast is going out in a couple of days, but it came out just yesterday. And already I've got some amazing kind of feedback um, on social media, I've had people contact me privately, priests, Catholic priests, current Catholic priests, and former members of Opus Dei, current members of Opus Dei, who've said, this is a story that needs to be told, thank you for telling it. But there's also a whole wave of people who jump on the book and take it in directions that are just absolutely crazy, some of them. I mean, it's hard to cut through that noise, and 
all I can say, I mean, obviously this is very self-serving, but like, please just go and read the book. You don't have to buy it. Go and borrow it from your local library if you don't want to, if you don't have the money or you don't want to spend the money. But look, just read it. There's The book's almost 500 pages long. 100 of those pages are dedicated to endnotes, which detail the sources for each of the you know various um, things I'm saying. This is a, a serious book. I'm a serious journalist. I've been, you know, writing for some of the biggest news agencies in the world for 20 years. Um, yeah, people need to take this seriously. This is this is real. Yes, and when he says people, that includes women, because women have been such the targets. When he talks about uh, going back to Roe v. Wade and talking about that conversation with Peter Thiel, we have been targeted and you actually say something very brilliant at, at the end of this. If the current Pope is not able to do the changes that he needs to do related to Opus Dei, which by the way means work of God in Latin, backed by its army of donors, you write, the movement will plow forward with its plans to re-Christianize the planet, whether that's what people want or not. You wrote, uh, given its supporters' unexpected victory over abortion, it's quite possible that Opus Dei and its sympathizers could mastermind equally devastating victories in the area of gay marriage, secular education, scientific research, and the arts. This is something to be taken so seriously. And my question for you, my final question is, A, I thank you for your bravery, because it's very brave to do this type of work. But you talk about litigation terrorism. Yesterday, Opus Dei responded to your book with a you know eight point you know statement, and I just want to ask you if there's anything you can talk to. The media has been very timid about doing these stories, very timid about covering people like Leonard Leo. And why is it so important at this time? As I just quoted you saying, why it's so important, but in your own words in this interview kind of how can you wake people up to why this is so important to not be timid and and everything that is at stake well people are reluctant to to report on this because i know from speaking to so many reporters that people like leonard leo and opus day as an organization are extremely litigious um well i mean i say litigious i mean what they actually do is normally they engage in as i've said before this um litigation terrorism. So they bombard people with threatening letters. They might not necessarily take them to court or or even have any intention of following through on the threats, but they threaten. They use their money to um, to to intimidate reporters and try to suppress the truth. But coming back to what you were saying earlier about, you know, if we don't um, address this issue now, you know, like what their what their intentions this re-Christianization of the world, that is how Opus Dei itself describes it. But it has nothing at all to do with the Christianity that most Catholics and other Christian denominations would, would recognize. After the 2020 US election, Pope Francis came out and he called for reconciliation. But what Opus Dei in the United States along with many you know, of the figures allied to it, people like Leonard Leo and Bill Barr or whatever, what they did was they sought to basically um, seed even more division within the country. They, they, they sought to fuel the culture wars. These so-called devout Catholics, these radical conservative figures are ignoring what the Pope's saying. What they're doing has nothing at all to do with the Catholic church today. What they're trying to do is so dissent in order to push through their own radically conservative agenda. This it's a political agenda. It's not a religious agenda. It's it's grounded. I mean, they they use religion to basically justify what they're doing. But what they what they basically want to do is is um, is unwind any progressive um, drift in society that they that they disagree with. I mean, Leo himself has spoken recently about wanting to, um, what was the precise phrase? It was um, to crush liberal dominance across, you know, across the field. 
not just in the judiciary, which he's done very successfully in, um, in, in over the past 20, 30 years, but um, he, he's now targeting the worlds of media, entertainment, education, like, you know, the takeover, the conservative takeover of the Supreme Court is just the beginning. You know, wow. things like Project 2025 and this 10AO network that, that Leo is, has set up al alongside, um, what they envisage is a complete um, overhaul of society that touches on everything. You know, they, they want to turn the clock back, not just to the 60s and pre-Vatican II, but but you know, almost much further. It's 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 scary stuff. And the the current election in the U.S. is going to be critical for that. You know, it's pretty clear that if Trump is elected, then Project Twenty Twenty Five gets the green light. Basically, um, you know, Kevin Roberts has been talked about. This guy who gets his his spiritual direction from Obama State priests in in D.C. You know, people have talked about him as a possible chief of staff for, for Donald Trump. Um, you know, like this is a guy who wants to see revolution in the United States. Um, he's talked about how the revolution will remain bloodless only if the left allows it to be. I mean, for me, the parallels between what's happening today in the US and 1930 Spain, where Opus Dei again was fermenting this this culture of division and the, the culture wars and it's the parallels are, are, are scary. And we, we all know how things ended in Spain in the, in the thirties. And, you know, I, I, I pray that that does not happen in the United States. It's almost like there's a fascist playbook and they continue to run it while perfecting mm -hmm. different elements. What happened in fascist Spain, what happened in Hitler's Germany in the Weimar Republic, uh, and what ha you know what's happening now in America? They they there's a lot of parallels there. Yeah, and I think you know like Opus Dei had absolutely no qualms about getting into bed with the murderous Franco dictatorship in Spain. You know, it, it's um, it's received huge amounts of money from the regime, all of this kind of operational help, and um, and they were offering up their services to suppress the workers and things in Spain. Um, it's, you know, how an organization can profess to be deeply rooted in its Christian values and at the same time be getting into bed with a regime that had killed tens of thousands of political opponents during peacetime, not during the war, but during peacetime, had um, pushed hundreds of thousands of people into to forced labor camps. And this regime that was actively sending um, innocent Spaniards to be experimented on by the Nazis who were looking for a so-called red gene. Opus Dei was in bed with this, with this um, regime. The, I mean, like, I'm sorry, but it's an absolute joke for them to say that they're a Christian organization who have deep faith. Getting to bed with people like that has nothing at all to do with Christianity. The, can you explain a little bit about the the relationship between Opus Dei and the Supreme Court and some of the members of the Supreme Court, as well as Leonard Leo um, uh, being a member of Opus Dei, having put um, a, you know six of the members of the Supreme Court on the bench? Well, I mean, just to be clear, I mean, Opus, um, Leonard Leo has, has, has told reporters before that he isn't a member of Opus Dei, and I'm happy to take that at face value, but um, his affiliation with Opus Dei is not in doubt at all. I mean, this is a guy right. that is a board member at the Opus Dei Center in, in, in Washington, D.C. Yeah. He sent his, you know, he sent his, all of his kids to the, the Opus Dei schools in D.C., and, you know, he's finance various Opus Dei initiatives. He's the face of this new push to launch a number of Opus Dei schools all across the United States. So we can say pretty confidently that he's um, certainly a supporter of, of Opus Dei. Right. He said as much himself as well. There, there's um, a name for um, people who aren't members, um, but help the organization, right? Yeah, I mean, the um, Opus Dei, is very clever at coming up with all of these um, specific terms. And what, what it does is basically create, it creates like a, a swamp for journalists. So whenever journalists get it slightly wrong, 
They'll right. say, oh, that's, you know, that's, you're wrong though. You need to correct that or whatever. And wow. so it's, it's kind of a bit of a game almost, but like it. So I think it's, it's better to not get bogged down in the lexicology that Opus Dei has chosen to use to basically trip people up. Right. Um, and I think we, let's just call them for what they are. These are Opus Dei um, affiliates or Opus Dei supporters. Yeah. Um, Leonard Leo is, is certainly one of them. And speaking of the Supreme Court, I mean, Antonin Scalia, he was a regular at Opus Dei retreats in Washington, you know, from the late 80s, right up until he passed away in 2016. And he, um, you know, he did all kinds of support things for Opus Dei as well. He, he went to a fundraising event and helped them to, to get the money to set up a new center. The links with the today's um, Supreme Court, I think, are... There are no direct links. I'm not saying in the book that Opus Dei in Rome decided, right, we need this guy, this guy, and this woman to go into the sure. Supreme Court. But what Opus Dei has been doing for the last, certainly since the 80s, 90s in Washington, D.C., is they've been pouring money and resources into D.C. with a, with a view to penetrating the city's political and judicial elite. And they've done that very successfully. And Leonard Leo is the epitome of that. So he may not officially be a member, but he's very much within the Opus Dei orbit. He's, he's been weaned on this philosophy of anything goes in order to achieve this mission of re-Christianizing the world. And so you have a guy who's in this very powerful position of being able to effectively handpick Supreme Court justices. And, you know, he's got this worldview of, of I'm a kind of a missionary. I'm, I'm, I'm someone who's, you know, it's, I'm in a it's position. It's a holy war, right? It's, a, it's literally a holy war to them. Uh, it, it, they call themselves holy warriors, right? Absolutely. And as I was saying earlier, Escriva used all of this language about it being a war and entering into battle and the enemies of Christ and we're an army. Yeah. And, you know, like, People like Kevin Roberts and Leonard Leo, they buy into this idea of it being a war. Um, I mean, I'm not I'm not that that old. I'm in my kind of early 40s. But I, re I mean, maybe I'm looking back through rose tinted glasses, but I remember a time when people could have debate and kind of come to some kind of compromise and agree to disagree and stuff when things weren't framed as being us against them. Yeah. But it seems that we've kind of been pushed into this world. And I, and I believe that Opus Dei has helped to ferment this. And many other figures in Washington and many other cities around the world have fueled these kind of this division. And so we're, ne we're now, they've almost created a reality where it is almost us against them. And it's, 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 um, it's, it's, it's depressing. And, you know, I, I hope we can get back to more reasonable debate and, agreeing to disagree and finding compromises. But but from what I sense, neither Opus Dei nor many of its um, followers or affiliates are interested in compromise. And that really is our mission, what you just said, getting back to that place where we can agree to disagree because this polarization is dangerous and scary. And America, you have been warned. Gareth Gore, thank you so much for this interview. Thank you so much for your book. The book is Opus. The Cult of Dark Money, Human Trafficking, and right, right Wing Conspiracy Inside the Catholic Church. And for our viewers who are not in America, America is just one piece of this. This is a global enterprise, in your own words, to target the elite. This is a, a nexus of power that they're aiming for. And I feel like I know so much more than I did an hour ago. And I thank you on behalf of Jim and High Five for your time today. Thank you all for your great questions. It's been it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks so much.